Welcome to Alabama Short Stories, when you're a little behind on your Alabama history. I'm your host, Sean Wright. In 2001, Birmingham was awarded a franchise in the newly created XFL Football League, yet another in the long line of professional sports teams that tried to make a go of it in the football capital of the South. The team name was announced not long after the franchise had been awarded, and the name Birmingham Blast was not well received. It's a good name. It rolls off the tongue. It was just not the right name for this town. The owners of the team and league were Vince McMahon's WWF and the NBC Network. They can be forgiven for not knowing that one mile directly north of Legion Field, home of the new football team, was a part of the North Smithfield community known as Dynamite Hill. And it wasn't named that because of its dynamite location or views. But league officials should have at least been aware of the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing where four girls died in 1963. Or maybe the 1989 assassination of Judge Robert Vance at his home when he opened a package that contained a bomb. And they certainly should have been aware of the bombing of the New Women, All Women Clinic by domestic terrorist Eric Robert Rudolph, which killed police officer Robert Sanderson and critically injured nurse Emily Lyons. That happened in 1998, three years before the team announced its name. Once this was pointed out to team officials, the name was quickly changed to the Birmingham Bolts, as in Thunderbolts. The team went on to a 2-8 record, and the league mercifully folded after the end of the season. Years before, Birmingham had a nickname they did not choose, but earned instead. Bombingham. Dynamite Hill is a part of the North Smithfield community. It sits in the crook of I-65 and I-2059 by the interchange known by locals as Malfunction Junction. These interstates were not there in the 1940s. The only thing dividing the community was arbitrary landmarks passed around the neighborhood. For whites in the community, Center Street was that divide. A color line had been drawn with whites on the west side and blacks on the east side. Black professionals were moving into the community and were willing to take on the white establishment in the Klan by moving to the west side of Center Street. It was a community in transition, and white Birmingham would have none of it, and they resorted to drastic measures to keep the status quo. The Klan had started with simple intimidation in the fight to keep the neighborhood segregated. They would burn the doors of the homes or shoot out the big windows on the front of the homes of the African-American families. When that didn't work, they resorted to dynamite. It was 1947, and Samuel Matthews had gone to court against the city of Birmingham so that he could purchase a house on 11th Court North in the community. The court ruled in his favor, setting off the Battle of North Smithfield. Matthews may have won the battle, but he was too scared to move into his house on the white side of Center Street. On August 18th, as fans were coming home after a baseball game at Rickwood Field, an explosion went off under his living room. His life may have been spared, but the house was totaled and uninsured. Matthews lost his entire life savings. His attorney, Arthur Shore's home, would be bombed soon after. He would be bombed twice, and in a third attempt, his wife found a case of dynamite in their garden that had not gone off. Dynamite was the weapon of choice used to terrorize the African-American community. Each explosion made a big impact, both physically and emotionally, and it was easy to get and work with. The area in and around Birmingham was full of active mines, and they employed men who knew how to work with dynamite and where to get it undetected. There were many men involved in the bombings of the homes. They hid behind the Klan and the police department, and we may never know all their names. But one person stood out among them all, Robert Chambliss. Chambliss was a member of the Klan and by the 1940s worked in the Birmingham City Garage. He was outraged that the Jim Crow zoning laws had been struck down, which allowed upwardly mobile blacks to move into white neighborhoods. He had an appetite for terror and bombed so many homes that he earned the nickname Dynamite Bob. By 1949, bombing became a regular occurrence in Birmingham, targeting not only the new homeowners, but the bishops and ministers who supported these homeowners and the greater civil rights movement. Over the next couple of decades, bombing would become a regular occurrence. The incidents would ebb and flow, 
with a few years of no bombings followed by a flurry of bombings. Cases of dynamite would be hidden along the corner of the home, dropped off in the dark of night. Others would be more daring. They would drive up Center Street and decommission police cruisers and throw bombs at the homes. One family built a wall between the street and their home to deflect any bomb thrown their way. There are too many homes and churches that have been bombed for me to list. It is believed that there were over 50 bombings during this time. But there are a couple I want to point out. Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, a leader in the civil rights movement in Birmingham, was a frequent target of the Klan over the years. On Christmas Day 1956, his parsonage was blown apart, collapsing the home and damaging the Bethel Baptist Church right next door. Bystanders were convinced that Shuttlesworth had died, but he crawled out of the rubble. A year and a half later, a bomb was discovered and removed before it could do any damage to the church. And on December 14, 1962, a third bomb damaged the church. In 1958, Temple Bethel Synagogue, located along Highland Avenue in the Five Point South area, was targeted. The temple has a history of being active in the civil rights movement and was a target for bombers. Fifty-four sticks of dynamite were placed in the stairwell on the 21st wayside of the temple. Luckily, the rain had soaked the fuses and the bomb did not detonate. The fight for fundamental civil rights has been going on for generations in the United States. But things took off in the 1950s. There was Brown v. Board of Education in 1954. Emmett Till's murder in 1955. Rosa Parks' arrest and the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955-56. In 1957, nine African-American students sued to integrate Little Rock Central High School. The intimidation and violence against those youth were unbelievable. There were sit-ins from 1958 to 1960 at drugstore and Woolworth lunch counters. The Freedom Rides in 1961 started in Washington, D.C., only for one bus to be firebombed in Anniston, Alabama, and the remaining riders to be attacked by the Klan when they pulled into the trailway station in Birmingham. There were campaigns held in southern cities with different levels of success. In 1963, civil rights leaders turned their attention to Birmingham, Alabama, and the notoriously racist Commissioner of Public Safety, Bull Connor. Now let me stop here and point out that I've glossed over a huge amount of civil rights history to get to our story on Bombingham. If you're interested in learning more about the Civil Rights Campaign, I recommend reading Taylor Branch's three-book series on America in the King Years and Carry Me Home by Birmingham native Diane McWhorter. There's also Eyes on the Prize, a 14-part series shown on PBS. And you can't go wrong with some research on Wikipedia. But back to our story. In 1963, the Birmingham campaign was led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, and others. The campaign headquarters was at the A.G. Gaston Motel on 5th Avenue North on the southwest corner of Kelly Ingram Park. The motel was the site of the announcement of a compromise between local white business owners, city officials, and civil rights leaders. The truce address some of the issues demanded by the Birmingham campaign. This nonviolent campaign featured the Children's Crusade, where students filled the Birmingham jail, Dr. King's letter from the Birmingham jail, and the police dogs and fire hoses used on the marchers. And of course, the announcement of compromises between the parties was met with violence. On May 10th, a bomb went off at the hotel. Earlier in the evening, a bomb went off at the home of A.D. King, brother of Martin Luther King Jr. King was able to get his family out the back door of the house before a second bomb blew the front door apart. Luckily, no one had died in any of the bombings, but that was about to change. On Sunday, September 15, 1963, worshipers gathered at the 16th Street Baptist Church for Sunday services. The church is on the northwest corner of Kelly Ingram Park, and had been used as a rallying point for demonstrations held earlier in the year during the Birmingham campaign. It was youth day at the church, and youth ushers had gathered in the downstairs lounge to prepare for the service. What they didn't know was that hours earlier in the dark of night, Bobby Frank Cherry, Troy Ingram, and Dynamite Bob Chambliss had planted 19 sticks of dynamite under the east side stairs and next to the wall the girls would be standing on the other side of, when the bomb went off. Four girls were killed. Addie Mae Collins, Carol Robertson, and Cynthia Wesley, who were all 14 years old. 
and Denise McNair, who was 11. 22 other church members were injured in the blast. These were the first deaths due to a bomb. Even though they were children, justice did not come swiftly. Birmingham police investigated the deaths as if the girls were part of the movement and not entirely innocent. Bull Connor blamed it on the Supreme Court decision of Brown v. Board of Education, or they planted the bombs themselves. An FBI informant said singer Harry Belafonte Jr. organized the bombing. Bobby Frank Cherry was charged with the crime, but the charges were soon dropped. It would be another 16 years before someone was charged with the crime. Alabama Attorney General Bill Baxley charged Bob Chambliss with the crime. He was convicted and sentenced to serve several life terms in prison where he died in 1985. Dynamite Bob finally got the justice he deserved. In 2000, U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Alabama, Doug Jones, prosecuted Thomas Blanton and Bobby Frank Cherry for the crime. Blanton was found guilty in 2001 and Cherry in 2002, 39 years after the bombing. Now you would think that the death of four little girls would have stopped the bombing, but you would have been wrong. Ten days after the bombing, a bomb went off in Titusville. Bombs would continue to go off until 1965 and included two unexploded bombs outside of city councilor Nina Miglianico's home and at Mayor Albert Boutwell's home. Birmingham earned the title of Bombingham. It earned it because of the people who wanted to stop change from happening by using any means necessary. And the name reminds us of the people in North Smithfield and other communities who stood up to almost 20 years of terror by dynamite. Yes, we need to be reminded from time to time, but I think that we can all agree that naming a football team the Birmingham Blast was not the way. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Alabama Short Stories Podcast. If you enjoyed listening, I would appreciate it if you would rate it and leave a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify if you listen there. And if you know someone who might like to hear these stories, share this episode with them and encourage them to subscribe. You can also support the podcast by purchasing the companion book from Amazon.com, which features the first three seasons of the podcast. Thanks again, and see you next time on Alabama Short Stories.